This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. Merriam-Webster.com defines heaven as the place where God lives and where good people go after they die, according to some religions. Other definitions it offers include a spiritual state of everlasting communion with God and a place or condition of utmost happiness. A Harris poll found that 89% of Americans believe in heaven. Growing up in a Christian home, I have heard about heaven all of my life. When I was a child, we used to sing, Heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. I want to see my Savior's face. Heaven is a wonderful place. You know, heaven is a place that Christians like to think about. It's a place that they dream about. Christians love to talk about heaven. In fact, it's one of the main motivating factors in their lives. Christians want to go to heaven. Now, before we go any further in this lesson, I want to stop and address the question, is heaven a real place? Maybe you're watching this video and you're thinking, I don't believe in heaven. You know, heaven is nothing more than a superstition. Allow me to say from the very beginning, yes, heaven is a real place. Now, how do I know that? Well, it's not because of personal experience. I've never been to heaven. A person's belief in heaven is based first on the proof of the existence of God, and secondly, on the infallibility of the Bible. Now, that's not our purpose in this video to talk about the existence of God or the infallibility of the Bible, but the case can be solidly and logically made that God does exist and the proof for the infallibility of the Bible is abundant. If you doubt the existence of heaven, I would suggest that you start with those two points. Now, you can find powerful material addressing these issues at apologeticspress.org, as well as other World Video Bible School videos. For now, we're going to assume that you are a person who believes in God, you believe that the Bible is reliable, that heaven is a real place, and we're going to assume that you're here to learn more about heaven. Now, with that in mind, let's begin with the question, what is heaven? First, heaven is the dwelling place of God. Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 41 says, Let us lift up our hearts and hands to God in heaven. In fact, it is the dwelling place of the Godhead. God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are in heaven. 1 John 5, 7 says, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Secondly, Heaven is the place where the righteous will spend their eternity. Matthew 25, 34, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now it's interesting, this verse also mentions that there is special preparation that has gone on in heaven to get it ready for the children of God. In John 14, 2, Jesus said, In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now listen, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And so special preparation has gone on in heaven for the children of God. Thirdly, heaven is a place where the angels dwell. Matthew 22 and verse 30. You know, though Christians love to talk about heaven, Heaven is a place about which there are a lot of questions. In John chapter 12, Jesus had come to Bethany to the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And the text mentions the fact that Lazarus was there, but then it adds these words, who had been dead, but that Jesus raised from the dead. And so there's a group of people that are in Bethany. They're sitting around a table eating and Jesus is there and Lazarus is there. And in fact, if we stopped and, and thought for a minute, can you imagine what it would be like to, to sit at a table with Jesus and, and with Lazarus who had been dead? Don't you know that there would be a lot of questions that you would like to ask? 
In fact, listen to this. Verse number 9 says, Now a great many of the Jews knew that He was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom He had raised from the dead. And so the people came to see Jesus, but they also came to see Lazarus. Wouldn't you like to have talked to Lazarus? Wouldn't there be some things you would like to ask Lazarus? I mean, Lazarus, what was it like when you breathed your last breath? What happened then? Lazarus, did you go to heaven or did you go to paradise? You know, that's a point that some people debate. Lazarus, tell us what it was like when you got there. Did you see old friends? Did you recognize them? What, what did they look like? You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 2, the apostle Paul writes, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knows. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knows. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard, now listen to what he says, and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Most people believe that Paul is speaking about himself here, that he's the man that was caught up to the third heaven. And many people believe that he's referring to an incident that occurred in Acts chapter 14 when the Jews drug him out of the city and they stoned him and, and, and he went then to the third heaven. He says, I don't know if I actually physically went or, or if it was a, a vision. I don't know if it was actually me or if God was allowing me to see these things. But he does say this, I saw things that were unlawful to be uttered. Wow, that, that, doesn't that get your curiosity up? David Lipscomb wrote, The veil which conceals the mysteries and glories of heaven, God has not permitted to be raised. It is enough that we know that in that world the saints shall be made perfectly happy and perfectly blessed in the full enjoyment of God forever. Well, what's the point we're making from all of this? The point is, it's sufficive to say there's a lot about heaven that we don't know. But what we want to do for the next several minutes is to answer some questions about heaven based on what we do know and what the Bible does tell us about this place. All right, question number one, where is heaven? Will heaven simply be the earth renovated? Well, of course, there are some people who teach that heaven will be on this earth. The Jehovah's Witnesses, along with many denominational writers, contend that with the second coming of Christ, the earth is going to be purified by fire, and this earth will be the residence of the faithful throughout eternity. In fact, they speak of this as the new earth. And they go to passages like Revelation 21 and verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And they'll argue that, that God is basically going to burn off this earth and recreate it as a paradise. And they'll use passages like Matthew 5, 5, The meek shall inherit the earth. But friends, they're mistaken about this. Heaven will not be on this earth. Now, we could give a lot of passages here, but for the brevity of time, I want you to notice with me John chapter 14 and verse 2. Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now listen, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Jesus described heaven as a place that he went away to. It's not a place here. And it's a place that he will take us to. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10, Jesus taught his disciples to pray that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Clearly, they are different places. Consider this, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the element shall melt with a fervent heat, now listen, and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Friends, the material universe will cease to exist. It's not that it's going to get a makeover, it's going to be gone. You know, it's interesting that, that people who believe in the doctrine of a rejuvenated earth, it's interesting they like to use this passage as a proof text because there is nothing said here about a renovation. It only stresses the fact that the earth will not be. The Jehovah's Witnesses are wrong about this. So 
where is heaven? Well, heaven is a place. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. But it's not a physical place. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 24, the Bible says that God does not dwell in temples made with hands. John 4.24 says that God is a spirit. 1 Corinthians 15.50 says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You see, you put all this together and, and we learn heaven is not a physical place. It's, it's a spiritual place. And so when we try to answer the question, where is heaven's physical location, now we're going to come up empty. Okay, a second question. Who will be in heaven? Who's going to go to heaven? You know, there are so many passages that we could go to to answer this question. In fact, we could spend the rest of our time discussing this question. But for now, let's just choose one passage. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, the Bible promises Christians, it says this, And to you who are troubled, this is troubled Christians, Rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels. Now listen to the next part. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. We learn from this passage that those who obey the gospel will go into the comforts and rest of heaven. Those who do not obey the gospel will receive everlasting destruction. Now, a person obeys the gospel by hearing it, believing it, repenting of his sins, confessing his faith in Christ as the Son of God, and then being baptized into Christ for the remission of his sins. Now, at that point, God adds him to the church of Christ, the church belonging to Christ, and if he lives faithfully in obedience to Christ for the remainder of his days, he will find a home in heaven eternally. Those who have not obeyed the gospel and become members of Christ's church will be punished with everlasting destruction in hell. Now, for more on this question, I would direct you to www.beingsaved.org. Question number three, will we know one another in heaven? I've been asked this question many times over the years, and I believe the answer to this question is absolutely yes, we will. I, I've never had any doubts about this. You know, I think the reason people struggle with this question is that they realize that when we get to heaven, we'll have a different body. The resurrected body will not be flesh and blood. It will not be corruptible. And so in light of that, they wonder, how will we recognize each other? Friends, I believe absolutely positively that the Bible teaches we will know one another in heaven. First, I want you to think with me about the implications of this question. If we do not know one another in heaven, then that means, number one, that death is the final separation. That means that the last time that you were with your dear loved one will truly be the last time. It means that when you stood at the graveside to lay to rest the body of your departed spouse, it truly is the end. And that one day soon, you too will pass into that nameless land to join the anonymous who have gone on before you. Friends, our souls shrink at the thought that that could be true, that, that bonds so precious and so dear in this life are in this life only. A second implication of this would be that on the day of judgment, I will stand amongst total strangers. Either that or after the invitation to inherit the kingdom, the Lord is going to wipe my memory so that I enter into heaven with strangers. Now friends, you've got to admit that if that proved to be true, it would greatly alter our concept of what heaven is going to be like. You know, we sing the song, If we never meet again this side of heaven, I will meet you on that beautiful shore. Well, we'd have to stop singing that song because it's not going to happen like that. It's, it's not going to be true if, if there is no future recognition. Thirdly, you know, it's hard to even visualize a place of perfect happiness as heaven will be when you strip away the sweet reunion. Heaven just doesn't seem as sweet when, when you take away my loved ones. In fact, that's one of the motivating factors that makes me want to go there. Now somebody says, okay, I, I hear the implications, but I don't care about that. I want to know what does the Bible say about this. I want you to listen to some of the biblical descriptions of death. In Genesis 25 and verse 8, I want you to listen to how the Bible describes for us the death of Abraham. It says, Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died 
in a good old age, an old man and full of years, now listen to this, and was gathered unto his people. Now that phrase, and was gathered unto his people, or one similar to it, is used to describe Ishmael's death in Genesis 35, 29, Jacob's death in Genesis 49, 29 and verse 33, and Moses and Aaron's death, Deuteronomy 32 and verse 50. Now that phrase cannot be referring to the burial of their physical bodies because Moses was buried in a secret place in, in a valley in the land of Moab far from the sepulchers of his ancestors, from, away from his people. Somebody says, then what's it talking about? It has to be a reference to his spirit. His spirit was gathered unto his people. Friends, it's a clear reference to the fact that he went to be with his people after he died. And listen to this passage. Listen to the hope that David expresses. 2 Samuel 12 and verse 23, David is grieving over the death of his child with Bathsheba. Verse 23, he asks, Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Now, what did David have in mind when he said, I can't bring him back, but I will go to him? I think we're seeing David expressing a hope for the future. He anticipated a time in the future after his death when he would be with his child. He understood that, that he would recognize his child, that, that he would take joy in being with his child. A few years ago, a friend of mine lost his daughter to cancer. Later, I heard him make this statement. He said, I determined that this was going to be the best thing that ever happened to me. Now you say, well, that, that's a strange thing to say. But this is what he said. He said, because this is going to motivate me to stay faithful because I want to see my daughter again in heaven. Isn't that a beautiful thought? You know, many references of the Apostle Paul could be given to make this point. In 1 Thessalonians 2.19, Paul asked the Thessalonian Christians, for what is our hope or joy, or crown of rejoicing, are not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ? For you are our glory and joy." Explain to me how the Thessalonian Christians were going to bring Paul joy in the day of judgment if he wasn't even going to know them. But, but listen to this one. I think this really settles the question. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Some of the Christians in Thessalonica were concerned about their brethren. They were concerned about their loved ones who had died. Now, listen what Paul writes to them. He says in verse 13, he says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that is dead, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will not precede them which are asleep." Now listen to verse 16. "...for the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so will we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words." Friends, if these words don't teach future recognition, then I don't know what does. Paul tells them, don't worry about your loved ones who have died. You're going to see them again. You're going to be with them and, and with the Lord. And so take comfort in this fact. Will we know one another when this life is over? I believe the Scriptures teach absolutely we will. All right, let's talk about some objections that sometimes people will make to the idea that we will know one another in heaven. Sometimes people will argue, they will say, but we will have lost our physical characteristics. They'll say, you're not going to look the same. You know, brother so-and-so has always been bald, and so and when he has a resurrected body, he's going to look completely different, and so I won't know what he looks like. You know, sometimes people have even said to me, you know, what about a baby who died at birth or even an aborted baby. What will they look like in heaven? How will we recognize them? Friends, here's the answer. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know the answer to this question. I know that David anticipated knowing the child he had with Bathsheba. 
Maybe it's going to be a, a supernatural knowledge that will come along with the new spiritual body. I, I just don't know. You know, I don't think that this is a question that we really even have an answer for. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, the Bible says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Notice that he says, it does not yet appear what we shall be. Now what's the point? We don't know the answer to this. But you know, I do know this. Though I don't know what my changed body is going to be like exactly, I know it's still going to be me. Listen to this passage from Job. Job 19, 25 and following, Job said, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that He will stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh will I see God, whom I will see for myself, and mine eyes will behold, and not another. Job had the idea that he, as Job, would see God, and that he in his flesh, with, with the change implied, the new incorruptible body, he was going to see God. And he stresses this. He says, not another. He says, it will be me. It will be Job. Okay, a second objection that sometimes people make to the idea that we will know one another in heaven is that we will be as the angels. And they have reference to what the Lord said in Matthew 22, 30, when He said that in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels in heaven. But you know, to me, this argument actually lends heed to the point that we're making. Angels have memory. Angels know one another. You know, this statement of Jesus was made to show that in the next life, the marriage relationship will not exist. The, the point is that marriage ends at death, not that we won't know one another in the next life. Okay, another objection that is sometimes made to the idea that we will know one another in heaven, sometimes people will say, what about loved ones who are not there? Sometimes people have rejected the idea we will know one another in the next life because they believe that if we know one another and we recognize that some of our loved ones are not there, that recognizing their absence is going to detract from the joy of heaven. But I want us to remember Revelation 21 and verse 4. The Bible says that God will wipe away all tears from their eyes and there will be no more sorrow nor crying neither will there be any more pain. Now, how the Lord is going to accomplish that, I don't know, but I believe it. You know, God will not force anyone to go to heaven. He lovingly allows each person to make his own choice. Now, He hopes that everyone is going to go to heaven. In fact, He hopes it so much that He sent Jesus Christ to die so that it could happen. But still, He doesn't force it. Each man has freedom. He has freedom to choose heaven or freedom to choose hell. And I believe that when we stand with God for eternity and all misconceptions are gone and we can see perfect love and perfect justice for what they really are, that we will be able to fully stand in agreement with God and His perfect judgment. Friends, I believe absolutely the Bible teaches that we will know one another in heaven. All right. Question number four, will there be degrees of reward and punishment in heaven and in hell? You know, somebody says, you know, hell sounds really bad. Are you saying that it will be worse for some people than for others? Friends, I believe the Bible answers absolutely yes to this question. I want you to consider this passage with me. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20, the Bible says about a Christian who departs from the truth, for if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Now I want you to ponder this. In the beginning they were lost. Now, he says, they are worse. The latter state is, is worse. Now they were lost. Now they are worse than lost. What could that possibly mean? I think it has to mean that there are degrees of punishment. There is something worse than being lost. In Matthew eleven twenty two, 22, Jesus says to Chorazin and Bethsaida, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. 
Now, what are the implications of, of the words more tolerable? You know, sometimes I've heard people say, I think there's going to be an especially hot place in hell for a person like that, and, and they're describing some heinous sin. Well, I, I don't know that it relates to temperature, but I absolutely believe the Bible teaches that there will be degrees of punishment in hell. Now somebody says, well, what about degrees of reward? Will heaven be better for some people than for others? Well, you know, I don't think that this one is as obviously taught, but I believe the Bible teaches there will be levels of reward. In Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3, the Bible says, They that turn many to righteousness shall shine as the stars forever. Well, what about those who turn only a few to righteousness? Or what about those who turn none at all to righteousness? Are they going to shine just as brightly as those who turn many? And if they're going to shine just as brightly, then what's the point of this verse? In the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul has a discussion about Christians converting people to Christ, about their converts. Listen to verses 14 and 15. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire." Now what's the point of this verse? The point is, there seems to be a reward tied to the converts who endure, and there seems to be a loss associated with converts who fall away. Now, is that similar to the thought being expressed in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3? kind of seems to me that it is a similar thought. You know, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 19, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? You see, Paul views faithful brethren as a crown of rejoicing at the day of judgment. Once again, there appears to be a, a greater joy or a greater reward associated with those we convert being faithful. All right, question number five. When we die, do we go straight to heaven or do we go to an intermediate place called paradise? First, let me say that I know good and knowledgeable people who disagree about this, and I certainly don't think this is a matter of fellowship. Secondly, whether I go to paradise or heaven when I die, I will be happy either way. Now, with that said, I believe that the Bible teaches when we die, the righteous go to paradise and the wicked go to torment, and that heaven and hell do not come until the day of judgment. Now, let me share with you some of the reasons why I believe this. Number one, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 39 through 40 indicates that all of the righteous will go to heaven at the same time. Listen to the text. And all these, talking about the heroes of faith from Hebrews 11, and all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. That means that all of the saved who died before me did not go to heaven before me. Number two, a second reason why I believe this. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 12, the Apostle John said, No man has seen God at any time. Now John wrote that near the end of the first century, and yet John says, No man has seen God. If we go straight to heaven when we die, how could that statement possibly be true? Number three, a third reason that I believe we go to an intermediate place, a, a waiting place, Hades, is because in John chapter 3 and verse 13, Jesus affirmed that only He, only Christ, had ascended into heaven. No one had gone there except Jesus Christ. Well, that pretty much answers the question in my mind. Number four, if we do go straight to heaven when we die, the implication is that on the day of judgment, we would come back out of heaven to the judgment, and then Christ would say, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, that would be strange language if we had already received the kingdom once. Number five, I believe that there is an intermediate place that we go prior to heaven. 
because Christ's parables teach rewards coming at the day of judgment. Now, we could cite several examples of this, but I'm just going to give you one. The parable of the talents, Matthew chapter 25. It's not until the Lord returns that the servants hear the words, enter into the joys of your Lord. We, we could say the same thing about the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. It's not until the bridegroom comes that they get to enter into the feast. Number six, another reason I believe that we have an intermediate state instead of going straight to heaven or straight to hell is because many passages teach that the righteous will receive their reward on the last day. In Luke 14, verses 13 and 14, the Bible says, But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you shall be repaid, listen, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. When is the reward going to come? At the resurrection day. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Now the question is, when will we receive the crown of glory? When the chief shepherd appears. Friends, that's the day of judgment. Now somebody asked, well, if we don't go straight to heaven when we die, then how do you explain 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8? It says that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now, the argument goes something like this. God is in heaven, and if when we are absent from the body that we are present with the Lord, that must mean that we go to heaven when we die. Sometimes people will also use Philippians chapter 1 and verse 23 where Paul says he's in a dilemma. He says he wants to remain living for the sake of the brethren, but he says to depart and be with the Lord is far better. Now again, it's the same thought. The idea is that the Lord is in heaven, and Paul says that he was going to die and to be with the Lord. Therefore, it implies that he went to heaven. So the question is, how do you answer that? Well, First, I would point out that Paul did not expect to receive his eternal reward immediately when he died. In 2 Timothy 4 and verse 8, Paul says, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me, listen, on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Paul was not expecting to receive his final reward until the day of judgment. And he also says that all of the righteous will receive their reward on that day. Now somebody says, then what does it mean to depart and to be with the Lord? Well, it simply means to be in the comfort of the Lord. You know, many people who believe that we go straight to heaven when we die, they believe that it did not used to be that way. They believe that prior to Christ's resurrection and, and ascension, that people did not go straight into heaven. They believe that in the past, prior to Christ's ascension, that people went into Hades. But that after Christ ascended into heaven, now all of the righteous can go. They believe that Jesus had to be the first to defeat death and, and the first to go to heaven, but after that, everyone could go. But here's the point that I'm getting to. In the Old Testament, they believed that the righteous went into Hades or paradise if you were righteous. But you know, when you read the Old Testament, Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7, he said that when we die, the Spirit returns to God who gave it. Now what's his point? The soul went into Hades. It went into paradise. And yet the Bible says that the soul returned to God. The psalmist wrote, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Psalm 23 and verse 4. You see, David refers to death and he refers to God being with him, though he would be going to paradise, not to heaven. Psalm 139 and verse 8, If I make my bed in Sheol, Sheol is the Hebrew word for Hades. He said, I'm going to go into the Hadean realm, specifically paradise, Behold, you are there. You see, even though some people believe that there was a holding place in the Old Testament, but they don't believe it is there today, they believe we go straight to heaven today, the Bible indicates that 
the holding place in the Old Testament, that the Lord was there. The Lord was with them. So the fact that Paul says that he would be with the Lord when he dies, I don't believe that that is any proof that a person goes straight to heaven at the point of death. Again, no one has ascended to heaven but Jesus. John chapter 3 and verse 13. Okay, last question. So what will heaven be like? 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 7 tells us that there will be rest in heaven. Revelation 21 and verse 4 says that there will be no tears in heaven, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 says it will be a place of sweet reunion where we will see our faithful friends and our family who have gone on before us. 2 Samuel 12, 23, David said he would see his baby again, the one who had died shortly after birth. Hebrews chapter 11 informs us that all of the great faithful Bible heroes will be there. Matthew 25, 46 calls it life eternal. Revelation 22 and verse 1 describes a pure river of water of life proceeding out of the throne of God, and in the midst of the street was there the tree of life. And so, friends, we will forever be in the presence of God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, and we will have no pain, only happiness and sweet reunion for all eternity. Now, we began early on in this lesson with 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and I want to conclude with the same verse. Paul said that he saw things that were unlawful to be uttered. Friends, the point is there are a lot of things about heaven that we don't know. But I do know this. Like the song says, heaven will surely be worth it all.